whatever that means. And it says connecting to cloud server. Okay. And we are recording to said cloud server. So thank you for hopping by everybody. Um, we're hoping to try and make this a regular Friday thing. I'm going to just say that this is Nikki's idea um, because it is something we had talked about for a while previously. Um, me, Nikki, Chuck, and Potter used to do a call. Um, we were trying to do them every Friday. You can actually find a couple of them on our YouTube channel, the Elms LN YouTube channel, um, in which we recorded code reviews. We did a lot of editing because somebody needs a lot of post editing, <clears throat> Nikki, and um, to make sure that it's appropriate for- No, it's yeah. your fault for making me swear. <laughs> oh, that's what, that's what it is. But anyway, yeah. um, so we're bringing it back and it's, we thought instead of doing um, kind of structured live code review, uh, which is what we did before, that we try to kind of get this to have kind of an unconference vibe. So if people have questions, they want to come and ask anyone involved in the call, um, or topics for discussion, things they want to showcase. I know Nikki has something pretty ridiculous she wants to showcase as usual. Um, Chuck and Potter hopefully will join us before the end. I know they have some things. Uh, but the idea is to create a space uh, for talking about web components, just like we have at Hacks Camp, and invite whoever wants to jump on, because it seems like Zoom is scalable enough to do so. Um, so before we, before we kick off into that in any way, does anybody have any questions about that? structure or think there'd be some interesting changes we could make to it. We do plan on recording these and then chunking up people's individual little talks if we have kind of talk with Q&A type of things that emerge. But any, any questions or suggestions? Boom, the board votes unanimously. Okay, so um, since we're gonna attempt to keep unconference format, if you will. Um, this would be the time that anybody can propose a topic that they would like to share. Um, you don't need to necessarily hop on and like say who you are and whatnot. Um, we if could you use chat if you don't for feel that. comfortable. Yeah, if you want to use chat or whatever, if you don't want it to go on the, the official recording, um, then that's perfectly fine. But so if you don't know me, I'm BTO Pro on all social platforms. I'm Brian Olandike. I work at Penn State. Uh, we work a lot on web components driven things with Hacks the Web, and I am incredibly blessed to work to the avatar to my right today. I'm going over towards her. So, then she, go ahead, Nikki, say who, who you are. All right. So, I'm Nikki Massaro Kaufman. I also work with Brian at the College of Arts and Architecture. And um, how long have I been with us? Like three years now? Has it been three or just two and a half? Uh, like two and a half, two, two and a half. Okay, so I've been around uh, two and a half years, uh, worked for Penn State before that in um, the world campus, and uh, I like to play in, in the land of front end and where the interface and accessibility and the content authors all sort of meet, and I guess that's, that's an introduction-ish. Do I have to say nice things about you too? Um, I guess I screwed up. It should also we should say like what it is we want to talk about or what we plan on showing. So oh, yeah. Okay. You, I'll go after you. All right. So stuff that I can show would be, um, we could talk about the facelift that I'm giving hacks. We could talk about what I'm doing with simple fields, um, which is our major form field overhaul, or we could talk about, um, you know, some of the old oldies but goodies like simple colors and the tabs, accordions, video player, all of those good things. So kind of open to whatever. All right. So I wanted to talk about um, if anyone had any ideas for a translation methodology and what our problem is currently with internationalization and translation of, of components um, and looking at a library and maybe see if I can get ideas from anyone. Um, I'll say I'm going to co-opt you on the hacks showcase, Nikki. If you want to focus on the more technical side with the symbol fields thing, I'll focus on um, hack what, you know, what hacks is now. Because I bet, I bet Colin is the only person on this call that knows what hacks is now. Um, but we had a, um, the National Archives did a, a formalized audit of the interface, um, which I implemented a whole bunch of. And then Nikki cleaned up as of 2.30 in the morning last night because she's awesome and doesn't sleep. Um, so I'll take the, I'll take all the credit there until the NARA people show up because they might hop on this call too. 
But um, Eric, you got anything that you were interested in learning or wanted to talk about or say hi or whatever? I just wanted to sit in and see how things would go and see what I could find out. Keep abreast of things. Okay. Cool. I can t I can show you the CDN if you want. Um, Ooh, that will be of interest, I think. The Penn State internal one. Um, Colin, did you or so Colin's in my class and stuff. Yeah, official yeah. official. <laughs> the, yeah, the currently unofficial official. Um, did you have anything that you were interested in, or maybe? I'm just tuning in, just sitting in. I'm a college ISD student. I'm in Brian's class, so. All right, cool. Stefan, is there anything you were interested in? I know that you always just say the same thing. Not off the top of my head, but um, I'll chime in with any questions I may have as we go about. Please do. Oh, Andrew's joining too. Oh, sweet. Okay, good. That is why I wanted to, that is the other part of the introduction is it gives us some pre-programmed time to let other people filter in. Um, Cassandra, did you want to say anything? Uh, sure. I am Cassandra or Castastrophe if you're on Twitter. Um, I work for Red Hat. I do most, uh, mostly stuff for Patternfly Elements, which is our uh, internal design system web component library. Um, we're in the process right now of trying to better integrate with our uh, parent uh, name pattern system, Patternfly. Uh, right now, Patternfly is React. Um, primarily, and then they also have some like suggested HTML if you just wanted to use the styles. Um, we're pushing hard to get them to go web components um, and show them the magic. Um, so we're just in that in that kind of socialization process. Um, meanwhile, we keep pushing our repo forward and um, building new stuff. So um, I can always kind of show some of the stuff that we've got going in the repo, like what kind of components we have, kind of show our storybook and, and where we are. And then maybe next time dive into like how our base class is kind of serving as a helper. Cause we're doing more vanilla, I think, than some folks. Like a lot of folks are using lit and other tooling. Um, we went a little closer to vanilla JavaScript web components. Awesome. And Nikki is going to make you show that storybook stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I don't know if they'll be showing up, but there were some people asking about um, some various libraries that they could look at that are lightweight and, you know, not tooling heavy. And I was trying to remember where that URL was <laughs> so that I could share. Sweet. Yeah. Happy to, happy to share. Uh, oh, so and Andrew, Kitty says hello. And, uh, <laughs> Andrew and Alex, uh, you guys hop, you hopped on late here. Um, but so welcome. Uh, just so you know, we record these calls. So if you have an issue with that, then you know, don't chime in or whatever. Uh, but we're just going down the line saying um, who we are, where we work, um, what we're interested in, or if you want to show anything. Andrew, I really hope you want to show the interesting thing that you're working on at the library and lit element. Ooh. I don't I know. I can probably show thing. it. Via screen share, uh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, put yeah. up anywhere really that it's doing anything. But, no, no, um, that's fine. I mean, that's what this is for. But sorry, go ahead. Cool. Oh, okay. Um, so my name is Andrew here. I already work in the uh, Penn State University Libraries, um, and uh, I do a bunch of different uh, things in the libraries, There's a lot of systems development and stuff. But uh, one of the things that uh, I've been trying to do is incorporate some of components into how things work. So, um, let's see. Uh, is, was, was that all the things that we were uh, no, that, yeah. introducing? No. Then? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Alex, did you, hi, did you want to chime in with anything or are you can hop on the chat if no or? Um. Uh, yeah, not much. My name's Alex. I work with libraries on the same team with Andrew. Um, just uh, one of the applications I work on is the electronic theses and dissertations application at Penn State. And we'd like to incorporate some web components if possible. That is one of the most appealing things I've ever heard is that last part. I just want the last part, Alex. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> all right, cool. So did you have? Um, all right. So as we go through, um, and maybe other people will hop on. So I said earlier, uh, before you showed up, Andrew, um, Potter and Chuck will be joining us a bit late, most likely, if they're able to make it. Um, but so I think we'll just go, 
we can go down the line now. Um, so I think we have, I was gonna uh, show where Hacks has moved to. I also would like to try and get some feedback about um, a, a theoretical methodology I have in mind for doing translations. Um, Nikki, you were gonna cover uh, simple fields, you wanted to basically show off the way Nikki always does. It's just I like, could show off, yeah. Just shows off. I'm gonna, but I'm it, gonna it's incredible. I'm going to flex the work that I've been yes. doing. Please do, because it's phenomenal. Um, and then uh, Cassandra. You know this is being recorded, right? So I can replay that every time I, you piss me I off. I say nice things about you. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Cassandra is going to uh, cover some storybook type of stuff. Oh, oh, this is another important one. So we'll go down the line here. Um, yes. Cassandra is going to cover some storybook. Uh, and show what they've been doing in their library. So there's, that's three. Uh, Andrew is gonna show some of what they're doing. Uh, Becca, are you there? Becca. Oh, snap. You probably should unmute those. So Becca, so that we're all on the same page. <laughs> this is recorded. And we just went down the line and did introductions and tried to establish who is gonna have some stuff to talk about today. Um, so did you have anything you wanted to show today, perhaps at a certain, government agency um, that has a lot of top level domains. Yeah, let me let me think it over and I'll get back to you. Okay, so maybe we'll have a fifth person showing web it's, components. It's Otherwise, like the will she or won't she cliffhanger to the there, end of the episode. Yeah, also some, she has some more hoops to go through because of <laughs> saying what I said before. So, um, all right, so that gives us at least um, like four topics and then we can run, run from there. Um, so I will kick things off for this, right? We'll do screen shares. Um, let me get some windows in shape and close some things here real quick. I don't know why my VPN has like six copies open. That doesn't seem healthy. Uh, mono repo. Um, the nice thing is I just accepted without testing and Nikki, what, like 5,000 lines of changes that you just pushed in the last few days? And I accepted it five minutes before here, and I have 100% confidence that everything works. Everything, oh, right? everything works. You I'm know like, I wasn't yeah. sleeping all week, right? Yeah, I know. I know, but neither was this I. This is so. like living dangerously. <laughs> so um, let's go to the uh, repo then. So I did want to mention this one. I'm not going to focus on it too terribly much. Um, this was a big deal. Uh, for for me at least in the last few weeks is um, I ch in a, I changed the way that we do our build routine so um, and the way that we ship that up so we still do a build that's called an unbundled build and so the difference between um, like a, if you go to Open WC and you run through their tooling and their build routine which I highly recommend Open WC if you're just getting going um, or you know just working on things in vanilla um, but OpenWC will do um, a roll-up based build, which is similar to like a web pack if you've used that before. And then you get an output that is effectively, hey, here's everything compiled and drop this one line in and your stuff will work. Well, there's, um, there's significant performance gains that can be achieved by not building everything. Because when you do that, you're building against IE11. Um, so what we're really trying to do is build um, build that will serve in a differential way. So our unbundled web components repo, I can post a link after it, attempts to have one way of doing all the building for your project that's kind of engineered primarily for like a content management system audience. So if OpenWC's primary target audience is more of like application building and hey, you know the structure of your whole app and then you're done, what we're trying to do is say, okay, you already have properties in place. Um, let's say that those are Drupal, WordPress, maybe it's a static website that already exists but isn't built with traditional tooling. How can we build web components in a really generic way so that you can have a single line to add to your CMS or what have you, and then basically just get access to these other tags. So it's more of an enhancement, progressive enhancement centric routine as opposed to saying, hey, we built a whole application this way. Um, the big win with this, um, I showed it at Hacks Camp in October, and I, I specifically remember Cassandra's husband being like, that makes sense, but I'm not going to do it because it's so many lines, um, is that we got it down to a single line integration. So what you end up putting in your site looks something like this. Oh, is damn. You, uh, 
you have, <laughs> you have script SRC equals build.js. And then build.js is an ultra generic um, uh, script that is a lot of that stuff that was in there before. Um, but well, this the, is new to me. This is yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, this is how I was going to tell you to do your, your um, is it the African, what is, what is that site you just put the video player on? You should probably African show Brilliance. Yeah, you should at least, you should at least show that site. <sighs> Um, yeah, but so, so the idea is that you have an entry point for your application, but that this little uh, script here is going to figure out if it should serve you ES5, if it should serve you um, ES6, but compiled to work on um, some slightly older browsers, or if it should serve you what this claims is ES6, but is actually now ES8. Um, and the reason we do that is because ES8 code, if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, the JavaScript standard based on what would be, I think, 2019 uh, or 2017. I can't remember which way it goes. I think it's 2017. Um, but that all modern evergreen browsers support at least that. And so if I ship you um, ES8 code, it will statistically run faster with less code than if I were to ship you compiled code to run in, a, in, in an IE11 environment. Um, so the other nice thing with this script, and I'm not, you know, going to super detail, but it basically does some feature detection on the front end to figure out whether it can serve you this, um, this script at all, is that it only loads polyfills for you if you need them. Um, so it also has one for animation. So if you need animation polyfill, it'll load that. So I've found this to be 50 plus percent faster than the way we were doing things before, even though it's just the same script, but put in one file. Um, I think it's because there's, there used to be some document dot write statements involved. Those are all gone. Um, but so we're using this now, um, Becca, who won't talk about whatever it is she is or isn't doing, is using this now. Um, and I used this recently on a non, uh, a non hacks related project. She'd tell you, but she'd have to kill you. <laughs> there, it, there's the stuff that we'll get in trouble for. So no, no it's more like uh, we're we're still in development with it. And we haven't pushed it live yet. So if we, it's not embargoed necessarily, but it's not something that we're publicly talking about a lot. There you go. So. Cool people theoretically could potentially use this repo. Um, so there's that thing. Um, but I did want to show uh, if Chuck did, I will leave this other tab for Chuck to go over um, because it is all him. Um, but we'll see if he's able to make it on by the end. If he's not able to make it on by the end, I'm going to at least show it because it's, it's incredible the site that he's working mm -hmm. on. But so this is, um, I'm running, um, a build a routine and I do want to actually show what's going on here uh, so you can see how we work locally because Nikki's permissions are screwed up on her computer and she can't do this unfortunately but so the way that we work on hack CMS and the way that we test hacks and all of our other elements in a quasi application environment is um, we actually we have a mono repo that's LRN web components and so we do yarn install in here I'm not gonna run it right now and so we end up getting our mono repo and all of its dependencies here. But then when we work on hack CMS, I sim link over to the node modules directory of that LRN web components mono repo. And this allows us to more efficiently work on all the elements in hacks, but do it in this kind of more production, uh, a full application environment. A lot of times when we talk about our mono repo, we're talking about like, uh, you know, Nikki's going to show simple fields later and she goes in and works on an individual component or a series of components. This is our way of getting all those individual components into something that actually can stand up and, you know, represent a website. So um, then I go into sites and one of my sites in Hack CMS, which then has its node modules and uh, distribution directories sim linked down downstream. I love sim links. I don't know why. But so now if I do yarn start um, from any hack CMS site, it is going to be able to, and it takes a while to stand up initially because it has to compile some stuff on the fly, but it's going to serve me my site that I normally would get if I had like a container up or, or I was running on a live web server, um, except it's going to give me it locally, but using those assets that are being built 
in real time. So this allows me to do local development, but against what looks like a production website. So I'm going to hit refresh. You see it's chugging because the initial like one or two paints because of the way that we do the, uh, the uh, serving these assets under the hood and I'll actually, there we go. Yeah, see it says generator has de-optimized for styles. Um, so it's gonna take a little bit here. There we go. It's gonna yeah. I'll say it's gonna do it like two or three times, and then it'll be good. Okay. So I always, I always basically spin it up and then keep hitting refresh until it's fast because that means it has everything cached. Um, so then I'll go to a page, and you will see a combination of uh, the Nara user experience audit that we implemented, and something that I only got to experience five minutes before we started recording, uh, which. Nikki has uh, cleaned up a lot of other U elements inside of Hack. So I'm going to go to edit a page. And now this is what the authoring experience looks like in Hacks. Um, so if you saw Hacks even like a month ago, it didn't look anything like this. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of web components. We were able to take elements that had semantic intention, like, hey, this is the, the bar that wraps this. Um, Oh, uh, Nikki, can you see if anyone has knocked late as a late arrival under managed participants? I just got a notification from oh, someone. Oh, yeah. West, just, yeah. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, if you can let Wes put I'm trying. I'm trying. Ah, oh, there we go. Cool. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna... Sorry, just let, let give him a second to hop in. Um, all right, now I'll go back to the share. You can share who you are in just a moment, Westbrook. <laughs> Sorry, didn't see you there. So, um, so this is uh, the new version of Hacks. Um, there's just a bar that can be moved around. Um, some of the icons that got goofed up in the last like day, because as I said, Nikki was really hacking on this a lot yesterday. Um, so, like I can hide the menu and then just have this editing and writing experience. Um, I can expand that back out switch the alignment of this menu. Um, it also, it, it has some much better mobile support. So it'll like sticky to the interface. It's a little hard to show with the, the screen streaming though. Um, and then these options over here are variable based on what I'm editing. So if I go to like a list, you see it says that this is a bulleted list now. Um, and then it'll have certain options relative to whatever that is. So if I wanted to say search NASA, uh, we can still do stuff like that in context, but it's a lot uh, easier to use than it was previously. So if I want to search for photos of the moon, I can now take that and drag and drop it out onto the UI. And it'll show me zones where I'm going to place that. So I can drop that moon there. Um, another thing that's dramatically different from what it was before, if I want to put that in a grid, I used to do all these these presentations about like, okay, and then I click this and then I click 40 other buttons and we're good. Now there's this little bar over here. I can just hit add column and now I've got two columns or I can hit that. And now I've got three columns. Um, you'll also notice little touches like this bar is a lot more contextually aware. Um, so it's, you know, jumping around, it's angling to the edges of things as they move. Um, I can take this heading, duplicate it, take that, drag and drop it over there. And you see it says H2 aligns correctly with where it is. Um, so we've been doing a ton of work in the in just the little tiny key operations, quite honestly. Like if I highlight this, there's additional options that show up, right? Because I don't need to see bold and italic all the time. I just need to see it whenever I actually going to be able to implement that. Um, so still work to do. Uh, we, in my, mind and, and Nikki, this is so that you also hear me say it because I say it quite a bit, is anytime there's a modal, in my opinion, that means there was not a UI decision made. <laughs> so if this just defaults to a modal or a fly out, it was, oh crap, I don't know how to handle this visually, but I need to keep working forward because I have this idea. Let's just stuff it in a modal. And so <laughs> um, you have uh, a, lot more, a lot more options over here as well. Um, so now I can take grids and I can either drag and drop a grid from there if I wanted to and manipulate it by adding columns or duplicate it. Um, you also have settings that show up contextually, which happened before. They're just a lot nicer looking. Um, so for example, if I were to put a, uh, 
like a stop note. I can either put a stop note there and Nikki and I identified an issue with drag and drop. And then under configuration, hey, what are you doing? Hide from the COVID-19. And so I can tweak the icon of that. Um, oh, apparently Nikki, now we can just select every icon in the universe, that's cool. Um, if it's set up for multi-select, you can. Oh, well then. Uh, tweak that icon, put it in there, duplicate it, right? So a lot of making sure that these things stay in place conditionally, all that stuff, we've done a ton of work figuring out. Um, also got the ability to view source, which I'm going to say, Nikki, did you do something to this? The code editor? editor? Oh, yeah. I made the code editor prettier. Of course you did. Um, let's say, because it looks nicer and it loaded a heck of a lot faster. Um, yeah. There's also certain options um, that we added and removed as far as some, some admin interface stuff. Um, I don't think I'll be able to show it in here. Let me see if I inspect. Um, I spent an illogically large amount of time. Hey, look, there's a pop-up. I mean, it's not designed. Um, an illogically large amount of time to get um, the voice command system working. <laughs> And you might say, what is a voice command system? And I'm glad you asked hypothetical version of me. So the voice command system, which I think will actually work at Axiom. Yeah, it will. Um, so I'll go to, um, let's go to example playground, it's safer. So what I just jumped off to is um, we are running hacks in a um, software as a service configuration at Penn State now. Uh, I use it for teaching in a in my classroom um so this is the act this version is actively out there in the wild versus what you were just seeing was running locally oh wants to use your microphone i don't think i have the debug on so it's kind of difficult to use um because the debug prints a ton of, of statements let me see if i refresh it if it'll still do it uh it doesn't have the debug in there um Hey, Hacks. Oh, that's not its name. Hey, Worker. Yeah, what do you want? Insert content. Oh, that's not what it's called. It's... Insert image. Hey, there we go. Um, so you have to actually see the commands. I'm still working on it, obviously. Um, but you, it also does some lightweight voice detection. Hey worker type, this is what I've always wanted to do is just talk and have someone else transcribe it for me. Oh, it failed. Oh, well. So anyway, that's an experiment. There's an element for that because there always is since we're coming from Drupal land where people always said there's a module for that. So the element is called HAL-9000. HAL um, it wraps the Anyang library, um, which is, uh, is something that works and anything. And the last thing that I wanted to <clears throat> talk about in any way, or maybe hopefully more so generate discussion off of is um, we don't have any good solution currently for internationalization. And it's, it's not um, just because of complete oversight. It's mostly because I haven't liked any of the solutions I've seen thus far. Um, and it's because of this problem. So um, when I see people integrate um, translations and internationalization, they're usually doing it from like the, hey, I have a whole application, cool, now let's translate the whole application into fill in the blank. Um, and the work that, that our team is, is doing is a lot more of, if we produce hundreds of reusable bricks that work in any context, then we can assemble applications out of them. Um, and so I'm trying to look for a way that um, like Nikki's video player, she has some lightweight stuff in this and I, I wouldn't mind seeing the way that she's done that, um, even though I know we have other stuff that she wants to cover. Um, but finding a pattern, um, and this one might do it with this lit translate thing, um, that we could actually ship our elements with support for translation and kind of allow people to pick their translation methodology, but us stick to you know some type of standard. So. Um, there's a nice little demo off of here and it's, it's shown in a GIF here um, that you switch the language and it basically 
runs through the array and reapplies everything. Um, so what you end up having is like an English.json and then, you know, a ES.json, every, you know, any, any other language you're going to support .json. But um, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work for what our use case is. So I want, you know, the video player to surface, I don't know if that's a hook or an event that it's listening for, um, and basically surface, hey, uh, here's my translations. And then every other element in the DOM, as it's setting up, be able to surface that, hey, here are my translations, so that that en.json um, or, you know, or, or uh, Spanish version.json is going to be generated on the fly based on what's there out at real time. I don't know how viable that actually is. Um, the paradigm, the paradigm I'm thinking to go off of um, that I'd love some pushback on or like, hey, have you considered is the way that our elements integrate with hacks. So hacks is not aware of uh, the video player. The video player informs hacks that exists and it does that through a static, oops, static get hacks properties. And so um, our elements have this standard schema definition and then the hacks editor basically as it's loading reads through your elements and goes, hey, do you implement this, this callback? If you do, then I know we can, we can have a conversation. So um, I was thinking that I might go about trying to do translations that way, that the elements themselves would be able to surface a standard and then something else would be the thing that actually came in and said like, oh, hey, you know, now we're gonna switch the language over to, to X. Um, Anybody think that's a good idea? Have other ideas? I have literally, you know, know of other libraries for doing this. I really have no experience in doing internationalization outside of Drupal, which attempts to do some of this modularity of, of uh, translation files. Yeah, there's a lot of, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, we, we do this a lot on .com um, and there's a couple of, I like your approach. I think there's a couple of things to consider. Um, uh, for example, like a lot of large companies are not able to translate immediately. So like you need to be able to have old content on a translated page and new content on an English page, for example, until you can update the old page. Um, I know we do that a lot of times. That's why we basically are hosting, I think we do eight languages, including English, and we host all of them as individual pages they're kind of separate pages because um the designs tend to be like this is the old design and this is the new design in english until we can get the translations back and then update the old pages um, so there need to be some way to indicate at least on the translation set in your json what web component it's using and any settings or config that that needs so that you could have slightly different layout slightly different look and feel on um a different language page. Um, secondary to the like, just the fact that it's slow to get translations from a large company perspective, uh, that's also really valuable because some concepts don't translate well, especially in technology. And so I know we have sometimes different content or diff slightly different layouts for some languages like Chinese, for example, or Japanese as a, as a means of like, better communicating with our audience there. Um, for example, like a Japanese audience is much more um, receptive to animations and um, graphics and things like that than a more serious like English audience might be. Um, and so like we, we keep things like that in mind. And so sometimes the designs are intentionally different. And so you need to be able to connect the pages, but also have slightly different uh, designs if you need to. No, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I hadn't considered the uh, even well, like left to right versus right to left languages, that would have a, a dramatic implication for that. Um, my immediate target was like, okay, if we have um, like a self check that gets thrown into hacks, if we can translate the hacks interfaces UI elements into your native language, so that even the tool tips and things are, are more logical, that'd be cool. But then if you dump in a self check, and it's written in English, it's it's still written in English. Woohoo. So like trying to, uh, trying to solve that immediately, mm -hmm. but yeah, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. Andrew, were you going to say something? 
I was just going to say that I, I think that uh, the core being that uh, I think that you, you'll need like a, a translate module um, that is handling translation. Um, and like you were talking about, I, I, and I could be completely wrong as far as uh, the, the way that you were talking about is informing. Uh, so if the translate module exists, then it's able to pass the information back through, through for the for the different components. Um, I I don't think that it's a good idea to have translation built into the, each one of the individual components. You know what I mean? So you would you would think expected it would be kind of a more global thing that's throttling it. So I yeah. Thought, I had a thought. Go ahead, Nikki. And it might be kind of similar to the patterns we're using for hacks is um, because I'm coming at it from um, the perspective of microcopy management. Oh, Nikki faded away. Nikki, you might want to turn off your video. Mm -hmm. Alt Altoona is destroying your connectiv connectivity again. Okay, streaming. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. So I am interested in the microcopy side of things and managing that and keeping it consistent throughout our user experience. And I'm wondering if we couldn't use a hacks type pattern where the elements themselves could broadcast what their microcopy is. And then somehow then you could create some kind of a module that would take all of that and and gather it up so that it can be translated somewhere centrally. And by module, we're talking, so Andrew, in, in front end land, I would probably call a module like a singleton or like an element that basically is sitting there in the DOM. And state it's in manager. Charge of, yeah, like a state manager specific for language. Is that what we're talking about, Nikki? Yeah, yeah, like a language. To, and I, I had played around with the idea a while back at because uh, I was looking at like glossary terms and stuff. But I really was looking at how you could do microcopy and contextual help and auto documentation if you had just some kind of manager that kept track of, of what your components have in them and what the text is that they say, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's going to be... This is going to be something that we'll, we'll have to, I mean, I know we're going to have to come up with a solution for, um, but yeah. I might have to actually work with you directly, Nikki, and get your ideas on this. Yeah. <laughs> it can, yeah, honestly, it kind of reminds me of the T function within Drupal. Yeah, and that's that, so that, um, let me post it in the chat, the little, that lit element um, thing, or lit translate, rather. If I can find the link, what the heck? Um, that is effectively the way that the integration ends up working in Lit Translate, it appears, is that you implement it in context, um, basically with like a T or use get is what they have as its equivalent. And then you can kind of pass, pass your variables into the thing in question and it'll skim through that object and be like, oh, you, you mean to have here like function name dot cat dot, first name or whatever. And then if cat's name gets translated into a different language, then you're going to get that translation served. So, all right, well, I'll keep, keep uh, slowly working my way through that, unfortunately. Hey, uh, Westbrook, did you want to, did you want to say hi or are you just kind of camping out on the? Uh, I can say hi. Hi, I'm Westbrook. I can so we did, um, since you hopped on late, so we did to kick off, um, we did, who are you, where, like, where you work, um, and like, if you wanted to bring a topic or something you were interested in, in kind of batting around, um, we're just kind of going down the line. So you'll be slotted at the end, but, <laughs> but uh, you want to say hi. Hi, uh, hi, hi. Uh, I'm Westbrook Johnson, and I, I, uh, I work with the team at Adobe, as well as I work pretty closely with the Open Web Components team, uh, bring in both uh, a really cool, at least I think, uh, library of web components based off of Adobe Spectrum design system to the world, as well as using those to build a application that I'm as yet unallowed to discuss too deeply. 
Uh, but uh, we, 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 once we get there a little bit later in the year, I'd love to share you know beta links with everyone and get your opinions because I think that uh, a lot of what we're doing plays really well with the the sorts of tools that you are are shipping. Um, not that they're closely related, but that they're I think help each other in some ways. Uh, but uh, I. I can either talk today at some point or or not. I like getting a chance to see what, what's going on first before I get too deep. But uh, one thing that I've been working on recently that uh, I'd love to to stumble through because it feels like stumbling through with people is easier than stumbling through alone uh, is uh, trying to hook up uh, our TypeScript uh, powered document site with Rollup and 11 to supercharge some of its downloads. And i um, not sure how fully uh, useful that is for other people just yet, but uh, I think in the future, once I you know, stumble over a bunch of the cracks, maybe some other people might be able to benefit from what's going on there. Yeah, I am, I am super interested in that from the, uh, I have, paid attention tangentially to Levit, uh, Eleventy, is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Eleventy. I, I think it's a word for 111. <laughs> Probably a fan of our J.R. Tolkien. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, all right, yeah, so we, we got um, Nikki's, Nikki's up next, because I'm done with my side of things, and um, Cassandra's got, got um, topic, Andrew, and then you're welcome to go after Andrew. So Nikki, you you think you got stable enough internet and do a, a screen share? Yeah, I did. Um, I did curse at my family. I uh, good. Yeah, I was them, hoping. The muting and all of that. So <laughs> Tom can thank me that he doesn't have to edit any of that out and let me <laughs> let me share my screen. All right, can we see it? Yep. Okay. There was yep. a silence. I don't like awkward silences. I'm awkward enough about awkward silences. Um, so I do was the paper input stuff because it's the old polymer stuff and we wanted to move ahead. And as I was working on some formulated pieces, I thought, well, I mean, I might as well just go ahead and replace that. I, I was replacing that and um, I don't have it up. The uh, eco, eco JSON schema form, which generates forms on the fly from JSON. And, uh, and it was using a lot of the paper components. And I'm like, if I'm gonna translate that, I might as well update everything. So the paper stuff had some really neat little animations on the inputs. Um, there were character counters and character limits with character counters. Um, some stuff with placeholders and labeling and some auto validation. And, um, you know, some, some icons that you can put as prefixes and whatnot. There were a ton of different input types. And what I decided to do when I was redoing the eco form is I created all my own inputs and uh, what we're seeing here is simple fields. So if I scroll down to, I don't have the data on this one. Um, let me go to this version. I'm not showing that data. I will just show you in my code view. Actually, I'll switch to that after. It'll be easier just to show the fields first. So this is being generated on the fly. Um, it can be generated on the fly either using the JSON schema or our own Haxified version, which is an array of fields. And once you have the array of fields and the values that things are, the form generates itself. It's got you know the inputs that look a lot like the paper ones because I cheated, um, check boxes, I've added an icon picker that you saw in hacks. There's a color picker that goes with something else that I do called simple colors. Um, we've got a select list. This is a, an auto grow text area. Well, it was auto grow. It's not now. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, 
it also handles the uh, tabs and arrays of items. So the interface for adding new items um, and deleting them. Date picker, and there's a code picker on here. There's also a file upload. So the, the simple fields is basically taking all of the stuff that we wanted to do, plus all the tax stuff, plus all the forms and created this, um, this particular piece. But there's a, a lighter weight version one uh, called simple fields light. And it's just using um, a paper or a simple fields container and then just the regular HTML inputs with some styling. So fewer components to use. It's not dealing with the hack schema. It's just dealing with the JSON schema. So this is the little dummy container that you can just throw anything into. And then if you really want to get fancy with fields, I have the, the one that actually replaced the uh, the one that actually replaced the uh, paper inputs. We now have multi-select and there got, is. Got the validation working too, because I didn't know Oh that. yeah, I did. Nice. It, it will validate according to patterns. If it's multiple that's allowed, it will check your minimum and maximum and give a customized message. It will, um, it will actually check if something's required as well. And then it's got the character counter, but it also has, um, it also has my word counter. If we move over to, so one of the things that this does is it also has these um, tabs. I don't know if I have a demo on here. It's basically reusing one of my tab components. And one of the things I love about web components is being able to extend an existing component so I never have to do the same work twice. So it's using my alley tabs and applying it in that, uh, that tab layout here. And it's also using these, uh, the, some of the behaviors of the alley collapse. So that's how I extend things is to um, just reuse all my own work. Um, before I was working on the fields, I was working on this video player, which is sometimes like one of the best things I ever did and other times the bane of my existence. And the reason it's the bane of my existence is that um, it seems to be, I guess like, you know how stores have a loss leader that you put a lot of time and lose effort into, uh, you know, lose a lot of money on initially, but hopefully you get other people into it. <laughs> thing. Or maybe on so that they'll be your friends and then can charge them money. Player is this thing that I made because we needed one. And, um, and so, uh, I looked at Able Player, reverse engineered that, made it look more like a YouTube player, but with a searchable transcript. Um, tried to make it as accessible as possible. Tried to make it as responsive as possible. I can turn my transcript off. I can add it back in. You can print it because we live in the online world. And I just realized I only shared that window. But it, it is printable, it's searchable. I'm not going to be able to search it in German. I don't speak German. Um, so it is searchable. And then one of the things we learned is that uh, when we had it tested with a blind user, they wanted to know if we could download the transcript. So the transcript's downloadable. And this is actually res yeah, responsive. It does audio. It embeds YouTube. So one of the things that my my lost leader or free drugs or whatever you want to call it, we don't have to edit that out, um, is that it, it does YouTube and we realized that there is a timing problem in the older version of it now that everybody's hitting YouTube in quarantine. So uh, a lot of what I've been doing is sort of putting out fires to make sure that the video player in this version can deal with uh, timing issues with, um, with YouTube stuff coming in. And then another part of my time was um, 
because we made this player and somebody in my office said, hey, uh, you know that video player you made? Will it, will it work in other content management systems? And I got the chance to say, well, that's the beauty of web components is they'll work in anything. And then I found out anything meant not like a WordPress or a Drupal, but Omeka S, which I had never worked with before. And so part of my time was spent learning Omeka S to get the video player into, into their site. So I spent some time, you know, trying to learn Omeka, which is very similar to Drupal, except for with lots and lots fewer documentation pieces. So I was playing a temp uh, template archeologist but uh, you'll notice that this player can be branded into different colors. And if I go back to my video player, you'll see that, that there are all these different themes that you can apply to it. And I wanted to make sure that, um, basically I wanted to save Brian from Brian and honestly save me from having to do the extra effort of it as well, which means I usually put in a ton of effort to save myself a little effort later. So I don't know how smart that was, but uh, the idea was I wanted to figure out which colors work in which accessible combinations. And so another piece that I had been doing was I had created this whole library of colors based on the materialized colors, but in a way that I knew that if I, if I switched accent color, that the things would be relatively similar in contrast levels. This isn't where it's eventually going to end up. I'd like to be able to do something that that does the calculations instead of me manually finding all of these colors. But I was, it was a way for us to get up and running and be able to theme things um, in a smart way. So let me show the demo here. So this demo. So we can switch it to dark mode and it will automatically switch the contrast of the colors. I can change an accent color, but also hard code so that certain buttons stay the same color no matter what. It was just a chance to, to play around and, and uh, figure out what we could do to, to give the users some choice in hacks without letting them make the choices that make things inaccessible. Because part of, part of my interest in um, in working in hacks is the idea of creating an authoring experience where you don't have to worry about people making decisions that are bad and helping them have choice without, you know, making bad decisions. So those colors are used in, in uh, these accent cards that I've created, um, use the same thing and they have an accent color attribute. They could have a dark attribute and it would make them dark. They're being used in this timeline tool that we've been playing with. And here you can see the accent color is blue. Um, it's also in a car uh, carousel and gallery tool that we've created. Again, responsive. Also gratuitous cat and video gaming pictures. And then the thing that I ultimately want to work on, um, but I had to get the, uh, the fields working was I wanted to get to the part where um, I could make an interface for people to edit tables because nobody um, does a good job of making a good user interface for people to edit tables without having to know about accessibility. So I, I had created this particular piece as a, a table editor that looks a little more like a spreadsheet with the insertable columns. Um, but it also allows them to add some of the things that they'd like to add. You know, we want them to be able to have headers and footers. So I actually have buttons to help them see what we mean about which things get headers and footers. Um, there, we can have a footer. Um, I wanted to make sure there was a spot for a caption so that they didn't do the cheesy thing where they merge cells like they do typically in CK and Tiny MCE. Um, you know, maybe adjust whether or not they have lines showing up, alternating row colors. That color is kind of light, so it might be hard to see on my screen. Um, the height of the different rows. And then you can see there's this tiny little double line here 
that's the ability to turn responsiveness on or off. And so when it's in view mode, it will either shrink down to two columns or, um, or what it'll do is you'll just scroll across and it's an overflow scroll. There's also the ability to add, um, add these little sortable column headers and that's just a visual to give them the idea that these will be sortable later and the ability to add optional toggleable filters for their table. The idea being that, you know, you could create something that gives people a lot of options without letting them screw it up. So that's all of the stuff I've been doing. Nikki, can you go back to the video player? I can. So you didn't even, you didn't hit on this piece, but, um, after after the hacks, linking? no the the progressive enhancement. Oh. The um the fact that you're you now can yeah, insert in there and you don't have to have JavaScript necessarily running in order for this to still give you the old, crappy video player. Um, so we've started I've started doing that with some other elements as well. Um, there's some definitions in hack schema now, Nikki, that might be of interest <gasps> to. You. Nice. That, that when it goes to save, um, it will inject a, a comparable version that is uh, vanilla, or sorry, that is light DOM, non JavaScript fallback type of a thing. Um, the meme maker tag actually is the only one that implements it currently. But whenever you like up, whenever you pick an image and meme it, it actually takes that text on save and injects it into the uh, into the light dom of the element. Sweet. Yeah, I've, I've been trying to go back and make sure these things are as progressive as we can possibly make them. The other cool thing about the video player that I didn't bring up is that um, we were talking about singletons and state management. Um, Alley Media Player uses that heavily. Things like, uh, so basically when a new player is created, it, it fires an event. There's a there's a single web component called Alley Media State Manager that only creates one instance of itself. It checks to see if there is an instance set. If there's not an instance of itself, it, it, will, um, it will set one and then set that as the instance. And then any player that advertises itself will first check to see if there is a media or a state manager fired up. And if not, their checking is going to um, initialize that. And then it will keep track of all of the players that happen to be on the page. And so that way I can do things like make sure that two players on the page aren't playing at once. It will, you know, when a new one plays, turn all the others off. Um, the other thing it can do is set a sticky player. So if it's tracking which page is sticking or playing, it can track, you know, where on the page it is and then um, set it to sticky. The, um, I do have an option in there to turn it off because I've been discovering that people don't understand what it means to be a sticky player. And they're like, oh, this is broken. There's the player in the corner of my screen. But, uh, but yeah, this is a good uh, example of what we're doing with state management. And then, um, and like I said, there's a, the field is a good example of what we do by extending classes, which are some of my favorite things about web components that keep me from having to do repeat work. Instead, I'll just set up vast libraries of colors and things that maybe I wouldn't have done if I had to keep repeating myself. <laughs> that, that's what I have been working on. So much awesome. As always. All right, uh, Cassandra, you're up. you're up next, unless anyone has any specific questions for Nikki from her. All right, let's see. Uh, share my screen to record, yes. Uh, apparently I have to grant permissions for recording. Hold on, let me do that. That's interesting. I would not be able to record the contents of my screen until I quit the app. Cool, so talk amongst yourselves, I'll be right back. Oh, okay, good, Sandra's back. All right, Hello. Do, you have, do you have permission to use your machine now? <laughs> I think so, yeah. This clearly shows I don't use Zoom very often. Um, we're a, a Blue Jeans company and uh, a, a Google, weirdly a Google company, like open source. Okay. Um, <laughs> optimize, can you share computer sound? Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. 
Sweet. Uh, I can make it bigger too because I have a ginormous screen. So sometimes on screen share, it looks really tiny. So just let me know if you need me to bump up anything. Will do. Cool. Okay, so this is our hub page, Patternfly Elements. Um, kind of started out our, so we have two different major websites at Red Hat. Um, one is our marketing website where we talk about who is Red Hat, what do we sell, what do we do, et cetera, et cetera. The other, and that's redhat.com. Uh, the other is our customer portal. And, um, and the customer portal is kind of the one-stop shop for existing customers to go to find documentation, get help opening support cases, et cetera. Um, and so the customer portal team, um, names that some folks might be familiar with, Kyle Buchanan uh, and my husband, Michael Clayton, started playing with web components. And they're like, you know, web components, this is pretty cool. It's a new technology. Let's, you know, see if we can get some of this on the site. Um, originally called Relements, but our flagship product is often like labeled in the community as Rel and they didn't want the overlap because this is a different technology. So we renamed it Patternfly Elements. Um, so that's kind of the history of the project, uh, how we got started. Uh, a lot of us kind of saw what they were working on and we're like, uh oh, this is cool. Let's create a, a collaborative. And so multiple groups now at Red Hat internally uh, who work on different websites uh, have come together and are now contributing to this project. So it's, it's definitely, the epitome of what Red Hat represents, which is collaboration and teamwork and, um, you know, kind of throwing ideas back and forth. What do you think about this? No. What about this? Yes. What about this? So we end up with a better project project and a better product as a result. Um, so anyways, uh, Patternfly, this is the kind of landing page for us where it just has all of our documentation. But um, GitHub is where all the like cool stuff is happening for us coders. So this is our GitHub under the Patternfly project. This is the parent project, Patternfly. Uh, and then this is us, Patternfly Elements. Um, and you can see we've got 17 pull requests and 156 issues. We're hoping to trim some of those issues down. Um, but we've got a lot, a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, and a couple of like big things we're playing with, like uh, design tokens, for example. Like I've been kind of toying with what would our system look like if we converted to using design tokens. Um, and then we have the preview site, which is Storybook, um, which is that same first page here, Pattern Fly Elements, and then just slash demo. And you can kind of see what we have. Right now we have a, about a handful of components. Uh, a lot of things that you would need to build a marketing site, for example, like an accordion. Um, we have, um, we use a banded style of approach on .com. So if I go to redhat.com, you can see a lot of our content is striped. So like, here's this top band, then there's this band of content, this band of content, another one, and here, here's another one. So like we use a very striped approach when we're building our site. So we call them bands. Um, so that's what this is. And if I go to the, I love storybook. It's really nice. Um, you've, you've got ways to add content and attributes. So do I want to customize my content? Yes, please. Header is hello hacks body. Epsom. Um, you can nest components. So oh, this is gonna, uh, that's good because it ends up in the URL. It's escaping it. So I can't put in nested components here for content, but um, you could, in each slot, you could put like a nested component, like a CTA component. Um, so anyways, this is kind of a little like look into how we show off what we've got, um, all the different attributes you can choose from. Compliment, that's pretty. Background images, etc. So you can go through the knobs um, for components that have um, custom events that fire. So we use custom events as a way for our analytics, especially. 
but also apps or, or other um, JavaScript could hook into them. But um, our analytics team can hook into the events as a means of tracking like, okay, this CTA was clicked or this was clicked in the nav or um, this event was fired. So if I click on accordion open, you can see this is firing an event here under actions that says uh, accordion and a change event occurred. So then you can dig in and kind of see, you know, what, what kind of event, um, what did it output, that kind of thing. So our analytics can hook into that and they can say like, oh, this element fired a change event. So a user clicked on the accordion to open and engage with that content. So that content is, is performing well. And so we can kind of figure out if that's what we want to keep on our site or if we want to move it maybe down lower or something like that. Is, is that something that's baked into your base class or like how do you how do you make the decision that these elements are going to have this tracking thing? It is. Um, well, the tracking is not baked in that the tracking we pay um, Adobe for um, we use Adobe Analytics for a lot of that and we pay a, an external vendor to write a lot of the, the logic for that. They're called SDI. Um, but we create hooks that they can optionally connect to and it just makes their life a lot easier because because what we found was actually and this probably happens to a lot of a lot of folks um, our analytics were tracking cited users only right they're only tracking click events it's like okay that's great but what if I tab to it and I hit enter mm. you get no data on that whatsoever right like all they're tracking is mouse users mm. so um, one of the things that we did was we abstracted the events as custom events and now each element fires an event and we can hook into that. And so, you know, the accordion changed, meaning it opened or closed, but that can be done via mouse, but you can also, if I, let's see if I can get it in context, here we go. You can do it with the enter key as well, and that fires the event. Um, let me see, the up down arrows move, move you through them. Like you can, you can really engage with it with your keyboard and now our analytics is capturing all of that with one event instead of specifically looking for the click event. And now they don't have to write something else that's like, find the click event, find the mouse event. If they key up and they hit this button, if they key up and they hit this button, we bake that into the web component. They don't have to know what is considered good usability. They just have to know that something happened and that's what we tell them. This one's really cool. Um, my husband made this, but I also really like it. This is um, icon. So a lot of us, when we're using icons on the site, we either copy and paste an SVG or we point to an SVG file, or we upload a bunch of sprites, or we upload everything we could possibly need on a, a page under the sun when you're building a design system. Like you don't know what your user is going to need when they're building, but you might have, you know, 200, 300 icons to choose from. Um, what my husband built was this icon web component, which actually you pointed at a location and when you ask for the icon, it loads the SVG for you. Um, so pretty cool, very efficient. You're not loading everything under the sun. You have access to everything under the sun, but um, you know, you can just start to kind of, you can see like we have a million and one things like how, how often do you need to load the restrooms icon on your marketing site, right? Like, probably never but maybe once i don't know um but if you wanted it you could get it without having to load it everywhere all the time cool. um this one's fun this is a, a component that uh, kyle wrote that converts markdown into html for you um, with a really cool approach because we do, um, we, we really value light DOM because if you have JavaScript turned off, we still want you to get access to your content, um, even if it's not pretty, right? So one of the things that this does is you put your markdown in a div and then what Kyle's web component does is pulls the, the markdown out, runs it through a library that converts markdown into HTML and then hides the original content um, from the screen and, and just, you know, makes that unavailable visually and then renders a, a new element in the shadow DOM that has the, the new content. So your content is available. It's not actually gone from the DOM. You can still update it through JavaScript if you need to, um, but it's rendering through the shadow DOM for you. So it's, it's kind of 
nice. You can kind of do it on the fly here. If I like change this, now it's an H2. Um, do a line rule. Uh, foo far. So you can see like it's just updating it on the fly. And then all of this is just going into the div. So this is all shadow DOM if I inspect. We'll see. Oh, I take take it back. It's not shadow DOM. It's actually in the light DOM. Um, <laughs> he's injecting it into the light DOM. So that's cool. So then it'll respond appropriately to your global styles, I would mm -hmm. assume. Nice. Yeah. Super cool. So um, I've been playing a lot with a card lately. So this is one of my favorites. This is my little baby. Um, I've got these cards. They have headings and padding. You can play with that. Um, got a little call to action. Um, I, I created this image option where you can overflow your image. So you can do like, I want it to overflow the top and the side, so then it fills your card a little better. Um, and all you have to do to accomplish that on your image tag is add this overflow attribute and tell it where you want to overflow, basically. Um, some things aren't logical, so they won't work. So like if you did bottom, but your image is at the top, it's going to look weird because it's not going to overflow the bottom of the card if you have content underneath it. But if the image is at the bottom of the card, it works really nicely. So here you can see it kind of overflows on the bottom or just the sides, but not the top. So that's really fun. Got a lot of things modal. Um, my coworker, Chris, made this. Uh, it's so beautiful. It's based off of the pattern fly modal. Um, the slot for the trigger is unstyled. So you can put whatever you want in there. You could use a, a, another web component to render what the button would look like. Or if you have just like text sometimes, you know, when you've got like boiler text and it's like, oh, do you want to read more about this legal whatever, whatever? Here, click this tiny little link we don't want you to see. Um, so, so you can just make it a link in line and, um, and make that the slot and then the rest of the content would go here. Um, you can also trigger it separately. So you could have the modal somewhere else in your DOM and then your trigger, um, you would just need to connect them with JavaScript. Um, but you could connect an external trigger really easily to the web component, which is kind of nice. Um, but all of our documentation kind of talks about that. Uh, what kind of um, APIs there are. So like you can do this.open if, you if your this context is this web component. You could do um, pfemodal.close. You, you can manage all of that from your app um, without having to like do anything fancy in the web component. The web component has hooks for all of that, which is really nice. So um, yeah, those, those are what we have so far. Um, those are like the top ones. We've got a couple of other little ones and there's a couple of things that are um, in the pipeline right now, like in, in our pull request, you can see like I'm building this chip component, which is just a little tiny. Um, usually you'll see it in filters, you know, you have little chips in the filters that tell you what you've already filtered on and you can kind of clear them out as you go. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, and our goal is to go through, oops, sorry, hit a button. Um, our goal is to go through the Patternfly proper project and convert as much as possible to web components. So if I go to patternfly.org, you can go to their documentation and see what they have. And it's pretty good chance that under components we'll, we'll be creating these in the next year. Going through and making sure all of these um, are in sync with each other. So that will you still, will the React components still exist or are they going to just be containers for these web components? <laughs> I have no control over that project whatsoever. If it was my, my world, everything would be web components. That's, I'm the web components girl, but um, I am, I'm not on that team. Ah, so gotcha. we're open sourcing it <laughs> and collaborating <laughs> and working together. <laughs> but, 
But, cool. um, but yeah, it's not, I'm not necessarily part of the decision making over there. So I don't know what's going to happen with the React. We'll probably keep going, I would guess, because uh, quite a few of our applications use React uh, to build their, uh, their UI. Um, React works well, like you can use these web components inside React, which is nice. And then you don't have to write any custom JavaScript, which is also nice. Mm -hmm. but... Very cool. Yeah. yeah, Nikki, we should look at uh, the, way they, story. the way they did that modal. Well, yeah, the storybook part for sure, but. Yeah, the modal, the markdown, all of that. It's, I, that I Chris did a good I, job with that. I need to sleep even less than I'm already sleeping and need multiple versions of me so that I can take all these ideas and do stuff with them. Oh, oh, you'll love this, Nikki. So from an accessibility standpoint, right? So when you open the modal, obviously your focus state goes to the modal, mm -hmm. but then you can tab inside the modal, right? So I'm like, oh, here's the CTA. Here we go. Here's my CTA. And then you're like, well, that's the only link that's in here. What next? So if I hit tab again, now you're at the close icon. Nice. And then if you're done, you're like, well, I don't want to exit yet. What, what was in this modal again? Oh, uh, back to the modal context and back down to the CTA. So it kind of loops you around in the, in the modal until you're ready to exit. Nice. And that is certainly an advantage of Light DOM because uh, we ran into issues with Shadow DOM with the way we were doing modals specifically on that issue. Yeah. So I had a, um, an element that, so we do have, Nikki made a modal and it works at least in a slightly similar way as far as she has a, what's it called Nikki? It's called like simple modal template or something? Yeah, anything simple means it was a lot of work for me to make it simple for somebody else. The somebody else is always me too. I, that's why I really like them. Okay. Um, but, I'm a um, mom, I like to put up like uh, training wheels and, <laughs> and bumpers and, and baby gates. Brian needs baby gates. I need a lot of gates. But what I found <laughs> was, um, so when we were working with a group that, with that I was helping them and they won't say who they are. Um, so then you'll know who they are. But they, the modal would pop up and then I had an element in there and I was like, oh, well, this will make it easier. We'll do all the work in that element and it'll be style scope because the shadow, this is sweet. But that element because all of the links were in Shadow DOM, when it popped up in the modal, it wouldn't actually find any of the links to let you tab through. Um, and I had to had to do a heck of a bunch a bunch of weird work <laughs> to make it make it understand. I basically had to break the shadow root of the elements that were in that modal. But um, it was the first. The modal was the first time I ran into a situation where I was like. Ah, great. His pattern fly people were right. <laughs> I, <laughs> redoing fields did it for me with the light on. Well, there was that and somebody talking about SEO. And since we deal with online courses, it doesn't always come up for us uh, because some of our courses Nikki's falling off. Nikki's falling off the face. Brian's kind of like Oh no, no, you have to be able to hear me. I have a story, but yeah, the, um, the kids book, give a moose a muffin where you like, you give one thing and then somebody wants something else. Well, Brian made me put those tabs into eco and the accordions and all of that. But then you had like nested shadow dom inside shadow dom inside shadow dom, which made things a pain in the butt. Yeah. I'm filtering myself. Um, to to try to style and to try to deal with all the events that were bubbling up and so i i had that epiphany and and the stuff that i'm doing now is trying to keep the fields in light dom that's my story i definitely like it i'm not gonna lie obviously this is we talk about this a lot on our in our project about like the benefits of light dom and why i mean we run into obviously a, a lot of challenges doing light dom too um, but I think it's worth it in the long run and it, it does make some interactions a lot easier and it makes some things a lot harder. So, <laughs> I mean, I think it's 50, 50 and it, it really comes down to your project and, um, whether or not the content, well, whether or not you have Java, you're likely to have JavaScript users, or if your app is even useful without JavaScript, like some of our apps, it doesn't make any sense 
because you you can't query the the database or or do anything like that without you know having your your javascript turned on the way that they're written um and so they don't really care about shadow dom but or light dom but for dot com we just felt like it's a marketing site it's all content so it would be really great if i have javascript turned off i can still get to all that content. And the same thing for customer portal. I mean, they've got a lot of documentation. We wanna make sure that users can access documentation, whatever their system may be doing. Cause it might be that like your internet is lagging and you're having a really tough time getting access to content um, in general. And so it's not even that you have JavaScript turned off. It's that like your JavaScript just won't load. Um, so we wanna make sure that they can still, they can still do what they need to do. That was awesome as usual. It's fun watching like these two, you know, we've got these two trains that are starting to have these like little overlaps and things and moving forward and Nikki's making our stuff basically just look like whatever you're doing. <coughs> um. <laughs> just for reference under normal circumstances, it's not, it's not good when uh, two trains converge. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. These these trains like it's like the Musk tunnel. Like there's tunnels that go. Over. We're joining oh, cars. Yeah. We're just we're just hooking up, hooking up Zipper. words, letters, and phrases. We're zipper oh. merging, oh. which is what people should do. <laughs> zipper merging, nice. Um, Andrew, you're you are up. Did you wanna did you wanna show what you've been working on with that lit element? Yeah, uh, sure. All right, so uh, basically what I've got here is um, the problem that we were presented with is that we have um, a professor on campus that is, um, they are working with a very old manuscript from the 15 or 1600s um, of um, a play, uh, so a whole series of different plays and um, what they are having the students do is uh, write madness that looks about like this. Um, it's called TEI. Uh, it's an XML format, uh, text encoding initiative. And uh, it's basically a set of tags that allows them to go through and identify uh, different interesting elements about a whole bunch of text. Um, it's very la labor intensive and uh, it gets lots of really good information into the text um, and it's a cornerstone of um, the digital humanities and information um, the the entire uh, group of study so they produce this uh, which is really not very much fun to look at um, and they said hey there's sort of way that we could make it so that uh, people could view this on the web. And we said, oh, well, we, we can probably, we can probably figure that out. So there's this project out there. Uh, it's actually at uh, Duke uh, called Citation. And uh, it is a JavaScript uh, framework, essentially, to be able to go through and uh, pull a TEI encoded text document into uh, a web page. And that was well and good, but we wanted to be able to do a little bit more with that. Uh, it's limited in terms of you could only have one on the page uh, and it doesn't easily integrate with other things. So that led me to make TEI Render, um, which basically uh, is a uh, web component a very beginning web component. You can see the uh, very late version number there of uh, 0.0.1. .0 .1. Um, and what it's doing is it's with uh, with just the TEI render and a source attribute, then it takes this madness and turns it into this. So like I said, it's very early version, but uh, it gets the, the basic styling in there. And uh, so the idea is that this is one particular act. And what we're going to be doing next is uh, taking each one of the acts, which are se separate XML files. There's a modern translation and uh, the original transcription. And we're going to be stitching 
those all together so that you have each one of the acts and each one of the different different versions you'll be able to sw swap back and forth between all of them so that's that's the project cool So are you consuming that uh, that XML file and then repurposing it as HTML, or how, how did the, what is this actually printing into the page? Yeah, so uh, right now it's it's putting everything into the Shadow DOM. Uh, I don't know if that's how we'll continue to do it, um, but uh, looking at the actual code, what it does is it um, pulls it into the Shadow DOM and it prefixes all of the um, the tags with TEI dash and uh, pulls out a lot of the different attributes that are on the various different tags um, to be able to do different things with them. Uh, so I'm trying to think of, because there's things like there's stage directions, uh, each one of the speaker. Uh, so you have a speaker here and then uh, these are the lines that that speaker spoke. Uh, so that's that's what it's doing there. And then with with the tags and all the various different attributes, uh, the goal is to then format it, continue to format it nicer and nicer, so that it's nice and easy for students to read. Um, some of the different features that we're intending to put onto it are uh, things like we want to have uh, through line numbering and the ability to target uh, particular uh, particular lines, uh, which I know doesn't seem like a, a particularly cumbersome task, but uh, that means that every one of the lines in each one of these acts has to be uh, numbered, and I'm hoping to be able to do that automatically so that it's uh, something that they don't have to code into the uh, XML. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool. And then, so would would some of these uh, these data parts from the XML then like inform uh, interactivity, or is is the idea that this is more of a of a a static display at the end? So it's it's primarily the display of it. Um, so by defining the uh, TEI encoded document, uh, previously this would have been uh, put through a server that does XSLT and uh, which sounds just since it's just one technology it sounds really simple but apparently they're relatively inefficient in terms of servers and um, because they're doing string manipulation um, it is uh, not particularly um, performant so you have these relatively large expensive servers that are running XSLT for these different projects and they have to be somewhat purposed for the particular project uh, and then that only gives you basic HTML. There's not any uh, particularly nice styling and it's 100% not portable. So those are some of the goals that we're hoping to achieve with this is that uh, if we can get this translation from XML to HTML and styled and structured, then people would be able to take this with them. We could move it around wherever we needed to so that it makes sure that it stands the test of time. Nice. So, um, as far as interactivity, uh, some of the things that, you know, we really want the ability to do, um, of course, the importance being uh, being able to browse the play itself and read the play. Um, it's this is being used in classrooms in in both sides. Right now they're using books, but uh, because this is all open material and it's being encoded by an undergraduate in a graduate class, then they're going to be using the material that's produced to actually teach these plays in other classes. So it's classes feeding classes, which is I think really cool. Um, in terms of interactivity, one of the things that I'm, I've been looking at is uh, the idea of being able to search within it, um, which it was just kind of a, a quick thing that I've been looking at. But uh, two different ones that I've been looking at are uh, Elastic Lunar and Flex Search. 
uh, as two possible options. But um, that's if we don't go the route of uh, hooking it into some sort of complicated server technology like uh, Solar or Elasticsearch. Because um, what, what does uh, can you pull up Elastic Lunar again? I've never heard of that one. Is yeah. that coming from a dynamic backend? I mean, now we have a little lightweight lunar search element that's in Hack CMS. So that's why that's what happens when you click the little magnifying glass in any of our sites. Okay. Uh, so is that what this is, or is this like lunar but served from a backend? Um, I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, I was just looking at it this afternoon, so um, I'm pretty sure it's actually uh, just local. I mean, oh, it's yeah, just okay, yeah, it's just okay. Yeah, reading. Oh, huh. Well, that's cool. Um, yeah, maybe I would, maybe I would switch to that. We had, um, well, actually, I shouldn't say we had a student. Um, Colin did a, a video as part of class, like doing kind of a review of hacks and um, pointed out some inconsistencies with the way that the Lunar JS based search is working. Um, basically, you need to have like the full word. It's not doing like partial match. Or anything so gotcha. I wonder if um, whenever you get to that piece um, let let us know because that's a that's one of those I was like oh sweet we can throw in a search widget and then like I made it and uh, hack CMS when it analyzes your content it generates the index and so it just writes a like a search data .json file that it knows where it's gonna be but I definitely could use some love and UX cleanup and actually having people dedicated to look at it you can't hear me, but I'm nodding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it, along those lines, you know, it, it, quite honestly, my next thing is uh, now that I've gotten uh, TEI render itself kind of together, now my next thing is to get it into some sort of a, uh, um, you know, similar to the way that Hacks has, you know, the pages down the left and you click through the different pages. Um, that's that's kind of what I'm I'm looking to do next is uh, to get into that kind of construct, um, which one of the challenges with that is um, with the particular uh, with the particular XML. I, I haven't figured out how I how I'm going to build that navigation yet. So. So you're just going to use our elements and we're going to talk. Yeah, that's probably exactly. What <laughs> um, I'm going to throw it in the chat. Have you, have you ever been to our uh, JSON outline schema stuff before or looked at it? I don't think I have. So we made a, um, you know, it's not a standard if no one else adopts it, but um, Potter, Potter and I worked through um, more or less a standard expression of hierarchical content, but yet sending it to you flat. And that is effectively what powers Hack CMS's um, site outline loading. So then we have a ton of different elements that basically can take JSON outline schema and present it. So okay. um, if you could get your XML converted into JSON outline schema, for example, that, that left-hand menu you refer to that's in Hacks, it would just render that way. And okay. you wouldn't actually, you wouldn't even need hack CMS necessarily. If, if you could have your element surface JSON outline schema, you could bind that data into um, Potter. What's the name of that menu? Is it like map menu or something? He joined the call. So. Hey everybody. Sorry, I was Potter. out getting emergency supplies. Um, <laughs> Toilet paper. Sustain life for me and my family. Um, uh, what was the question? I forget. Was that, <laughs> you I, got lost, the, I got lost in my horrible joke. <laughs> what, what is that side menu element that we have? Um, oh, right. Map, yeah, map, map menu. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which certainly needs some refactoring at some point, but um, all right, cool. I, uh, the other, oh, the other thing, Andrew, if you could pull up your, pull up one of your elements or that you had the shadow DOM inspector or whatever. I was thinking, um, even though you don't, yeah, yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, 
so you don't right now i see you're just like prefixing all of those right so you got the t-e-i-l element and stuff you uh -huh. could um if you knew like th those are a series of tags right yeah so i mean L and there's I and all that yeah so you could almost um uh you could have the tei element actually dynamically generate a whole ton of lightweight definitions of those so that they could each be their own component um i'm not suggesting you have to do that but just thinking aloud like you could then use those either from a styling perspective or from a functional perspective like if you wanted all of the um, things that would be the equivalent of a heading in whatever the like speaker, right? If there's a different speaker each time, um, mm. you could maybe have, okay, well, speaker is actually an element that I'm gonna include as part of this and speakers are clickable, they're styled a certain way, you know, you can, you can relate data from elsewhere, so. Yeah, because one of the things I'm gonna have uh, as a, a thing that is necessary so you have this tei speaker and there inside of that there's this span um what we want to do is you have the ability to click on that and it shows a uh, a little note um of information from the cast list which right now is just you know there's just a, a name but um in later iterations of this and as this gets built out then you're going to have like okay so master which this is the old english spelling of master fancy that right with an <laughs> f um so uh if you click on that then it would pop up a card or uh, something where you'd be able to see information about that particular uh character so nice you should um you should check out uh nikki what's your element you have isn't that absolute positioning behavior i was just gonna say absolute <laughs> position behavior does that and and then because i love extending behaviors or extending things onto other things there's a simple popover which uses the absolute positioning behavior very cool um even and even if you it's mostly just to see nikki's brain as displayed as a web component um with all of its chaining to other functions, um, it could be good for you to see what uh, the way that she thinks through a lot of like singleton design patterns, because something like TEI would be good for that type of, you know, oh, I wanna learn more information about this, or like the fact that you had that little codified knowledge of that that actually is the old English word for master, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, that you would want some global surfacing based on what's currently in the page, but you don't know what's going to be in the page. Um, that's that type of stuff screams like a singleton uh, paradigm. Or if there were multiple TEI renders on the page, um, one thing that's basically controlling, uh, you know, the statefulness of that modal being open or the absolute positioning or what the active term to search for, that type of stuff. And I. Right to help you think through this because I'm already imagining like the in the same way that we did um, the uh, state manager for Alley Media being able to do that you could easily pull all the references that kind of fire themselves up as events into um, array. This, yeah we're pretty good pretty good on any all right I, so I kept us at a 13 rating <laughs> um, yeah. all right I'm gonna I'm going to boot you off. All right. I'm just kidding. Um, so going down the line, we've got uh, like 14 minutes um, until time. Although, you know, personally, I don't really care about time. I can do it until whenever. But um, let's try to keep it to five. Um, Westbrook, did you want to did you want to show anything today? Or do you want to see? Uh, otherwise, I know Chuck has something that he could show. Uh, I have a lot of code to look at. And after looking at all these pretty things, I don't know if I want everyone's Friday to end with a bunch of code. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe we, we I'll, I'll, I'll polish it up a little bit better and we'll talk about it next week. And uh, if you want to, if Trax got something, that'd be great.
Okay, that works because Chuck's thing is gorgeous. So, Chuck, are you actually there listening? I'm always listening. All right, I want I want you to show the good people that have spent their Friday afternoon with us and didn't panic run out to a store in the middle of the call um <laughs> your your theme your your hack cms theme. <laughs> no, he's making fun of me too because i did the same thing hey i'm only making fun of you because my wife is out doing it right now no, um no. <laughs> <laughs> so um do you do you want to show chuck yeah well, let's go with because I noticed I it was Should it was we working. have been panic running out? Uh, we'll talk after. Um. <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep. All right. So what do you want to what do you want to know? Like you just give you a tour? Um. Yeah, I guess. All I mean, right. I don't think anyone knows that we have our own content management system that we're working on. That you actually can be as flexible as you are with it. So, oh, okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, we are working with uh, our own content management system called Hack CMS. Um, I've been using it to recreate our department website. This is our long-standing current site, um, and we're looking forward to launching this one now. Um, this is the new one I've been working on, but this is made of a series of web components, and basically that's how the Hack CMS started, right? So we started building these libraries of components. You need a card, you need a widget, a banner, whatever, and before you know it, you have a whole collection of these things and you're like, wow, I could make a whole website out of it. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, so just quick looking around. I don't have the latest copy of Hacks. I still need to pull and do some merge conflict resolution with Mike at some point, but. It looked um, like it was up on the server. Uh, yes, but I have a whole bunch of changes that. Oh, okay. All right, never put in there. But anyway, this is my local copy, so. Um, but this is what I've been working on recently is our resource pages, right? So with the university going into lockdown, we've had a lot of information to give out to some people. Here's that uh, map menu that we were talking about a little earlier in the sidebar, Andrew. Um, but yeah, I would just flip through some of our pages that we got going on. Um, but these are all like uh, web components. And let me get it, show you the code here since we can talk about code, right? You're allowed to talk about code. Westbrook just didn't want to end on a sad note. <laughs> okay, so this is like my site JSON file. Andrew, this is kind of what uh, Brian was talking about. If you could get all your data to look like this, and then you can kind of pump it into a, let's see here, a template, right? So a good one. Let's do, um, let's do resources. That's what we're working on. Um, so come to our resources page here. And all these uh, pages underneath of resources have the same template, the sidebar with the content area and a page banner. And that looks like this in the actual template. So, right, so I have this hacks theme resources template. Um, and it's got a bunch of CSS in it. And it's got, you know, the HTML that makes up the structure of the page. You can see this page banner here. And this page banner is actually calling in stuff from site JSON. So it grabs the active item, which is made possible by the hacks theme store. Um, you get the active item and then you can actually cycle through your, your JSON data like that and, and dynamically import, um, in this case, an image, um, which is located. Oh, let me get back here. Oh, wrong one again. <laughs> we go to site JSON and we come down to, let's just look at, um, bottom here so video conferencing right so you can see i'm pumping in an image and it's alt text by the active id and then metadata fields and image are just stepping through that and if i come down to our online conferencing thing you can see the image here and then if i inspect uh, so you can see page the page banner i need to update some some text, uh, the alt text there. But you can see that I have the, the background image and it's calling in that this specific file dynamically uh, for that page. So that's kind of like the whole method to the madness, right? So you create um, your content in your site JSON and you give it some, some you know, information and then you create your uh, like template and you start pumping your information in from site JSON into that. And then 
uh, something else cool like. So let's look at my blog section here. So this is what Hackstein blog template looks like. And you can see again, I have the page banner, um, a site breadcrumb. Uh, if we actually go to the blogs. So you can see I have the page banner dynamically loaded. I have the site breadcrumb. Um, and then I have like the information. But the nice thing is, is when you create these templates, you can also tie them to uh, static pages. So like the content in here, uh, well, if it was working. Oh, there we go. So the content in here is actually editable using the hacks interface. Um, so you can add widgets and all kinds of different things. The more little web components you make, the more little building blocks you have to, to throw into your, your widgets. Um, and then you can kind of put them through. Uh, you can delete stuff and edit it. And as you're doing that, it's updating a live page. So in this case, uh, this news is called uh, the 2020 Horizon Report. So if I go into um, site of JSON here, I can show you that one. So you can see this is the information like for the whole blog post where I'm pumping in the title, um, uh, the description, some image, all the author ID, what type of uh, piece of content it is, what template it's using, who the author is, little things like that, the tags. Um, but then you get this uh, static page that comes with it and it's located here. So if I go into my pages, and I should have probably did a better naming system about this, but uh, let's see, March 5th, now I get it here. So this is the um, 2020 Horizon report. And if I edit this in live time here, it will edit uh, back over in my code. So let's go ahead and just add a section real quick. Um, So now you can see it's updated in live time. Now if I can come back over here, you can see it's updated in my code as well. So that's kind of what we've been working with lately. Um, you know, I can show you around some other things. Uh, you know, there's a series, like I said, a series of components here. These are all promo tiles. They're actually clickable. We just hit them for now because we need to fill out some more content uh, for the landing pages that they click to. Um, this is this whole course uh, course display area is a, is a web component, um, so I can quickly go through and select my courses as opposed to going, you know, scrolling indefinitely. I have we made a cool search for um, it's a dynamic search for the dashboards. That, right, so we got all these websites that we're generating now using this um, hack CMS, and we have this dashboard now that Mike's been working on. Um, uh, to host all these, you know, to the, host the websites. And it looks kind of similar, right? It looks like our homepage basically, and it's got these tiles and it's got all our courses on it. But at the top is this uh, uh, search that you can search. And like, if I were to start typing Astro, it would dynamically filter out all of these to just be the Astro ones. Um, so I'm going to add that to this as well. Um, um, can you so, go to, oh. you go to one of your like either listings or your blog posts and show one of the, uh, the query tags? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's. See. Sorry, what were you gonna say, Potter? No, I was gonna. Yeah, I was gonna say that um, the huge uh, benefit to Hack CMS is you get all the benefits of a static site, but um, you can, since everything's uh, component driven, um, you can start querying um, this site JSON just like it's a database. Um, and whenever you pair that with a web component that makes it really easy to, to use, you start getting stuff like you would get in Drupal, where in Drupal you can go and just create a view um, uh, that's a really nice interface to pull data from the database. Um, you can start getting that with uh, Hack CMS because you're just interfacing with this one web component that's uh, in this case called Site Query that uh, Chuck's showing off here. Yeah, so right here we have the site query, and I don't know why, but I can't highlight it like I normally would and click to it. Um, usually you can command it uh, and it'll highlight. But anyway, um, the site query tag, 
is what I use to start going through the information, right? So like I need to make the page aware that uh, the data I'm trying to collect. So here I can search through items. And then again, I, I give it a condition via the JSON file. So like um, you see metadata type course. So in these particular instance, uh, you might see, let's see, metadata type right here. So this one is a type news in this instance, but on, I'm showing the course type. Uh, so you can see I filtered out courses. So this is my courses page. This is the template for that whole page uh, that I'm using. So I filtered out by type course. And then now the page is aware of like, all right, I need to know about all, my all the course uh, JSON information, in which case I can start putting it in. Uh, like here I have, I just made a web component that's a uh, course card. It has an image, an icon, a number, a name, some basic stuff. And then I just feed that information in uh, from the JSON file because now it's aware of it because of the site query tag. Um, and this DOM repeat, you know, just it just puts it through the every card dynamically. Um, so that's kind of what Brian was saying about the site query. Yeah, or the blog post ones that don't you have ones that like filter or it says like related courses or oh that yeah like news archive yeah yeah so like uh well courses would be a good one because it's related so like if you go to astro um you'll get all the related other uh, other astro courses and let's see how do i have that one done courses um, here. It's in my Hexing course. So, right, the course itself is its own template with a banner and a bunch of content. There's a spot here where, like, this icon is dynamic. It can be either a um, image, an icon, or a video. But if we come down to the site recent content, right? So this is the related courses. So I'm using this recent content block that's based that that calls a site query tag, and that allows me to go in and add uh, some additional. Um, uh, I don't even know what you call it. Criteria. Conditions. Criteria, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so I can start, you know, um, getting through uh, the specific things that I want. So in this instance, we are site querying um, an active item. And then if you come down here, you can see like active item, you can see it's stepping through this function, stepping through the metadata JSON, similar to um, how we would do it uh, up here with the metadata fields with uh, description you can see it cycling through there and then we return um, the actual subject for the active item so if it's astro you're going to get astro courses if it's chem you'll get chem courses and it's limited to five because uh, i didn't want to have the whole thing blown up so, so um and to point out that you know the the store our the central store in hack cms uh we went with mobx and one project that uh, people on this call might be might know about is a little project called LitMobX. And if you pair the Hack CMS store with LitMobX, it becomes a pretty darn nice developer experience because you could have your uh, queries, uh, uh, your site query tags, um, but then you can just import the entire store run it through um, something like lit MobX, which allows you to just take the store and start referencing it in your render function uh, without having, so if you see in the constructor here, um, uh, if, you, if we wanted to get direct access to store.router manifest, we have to use MobX to set up a listener uh, to listen for changes on the store. Um, there's a really nice project called uh, Lit MobX that allows that does all that behind the scenes and allows you to use that directly in your render function, which really improves developer experience. Yeah, we have you used that at all yet in in your Hack CMS custom theme? I know you've used it in some side stuff. Uh, just in the side stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should really look at um, uh, at switching over to that just because I, I agree. I even looking through my own themes that I've made for core or your, your custom one, I'm like, Ugh, I keep writing these stupid auto loader things over and over again. Yeah. 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 They look much prettier in all my demos. I've been using it because it just makes the demos look really good. <laughs> That's the only reason. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so we are at uh, we're at five o'clock. Um, thank you all for hanging around through here. Um, I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to get the whole recording posted, uh, and then also chunk it up into um, well, more or less. Nick, Nikki had a block. I had a block. Cassandra had a block. Andrew had a block, and and Chuck has this block here. Um, we're gonna try and do these every week. Um, if you have topics that you'd like to, to come with in the future, feel free to, if there's something that you've been having issues with that you, you would like to see someone do a talk on. Um, the whole point of these calls is in my opinion, to just give us all community during all this insanity, um, and have a nice, nice way to end the week, you know, on a high note. Um, and we get to zipper merge our work. And we get to zipper merge our work. Um, <laughs> Potter and Chuck, you missed all the work that Nikki did that just got merged in. So all of her work is now merged into uh, our mono repo. Um, I highly recommend it, yeah. pulling it. Those were um, all the hours I did not sleep. I, I, I mean, I don't recommend you not sleep, Nikki, but I do love the output. So yeah. But yeah, I'll watch um, the first half once Tom uh, re releases the video. But uh, everybody. Take care. I'm going to cut the recording here. So um, hopefully see you back back next week. If you have any suggestions or ideas, throw them out on, on Twitter, Slack, wherever else as to how we can improve this or other people, feel free to invite them. The only reason we have a cast word and a knock on the door thing was just so we didn't get flooded with, you know, a hundred people decide to click this, but I don't think we're going to hit that Bots. Well, Bots. And, and if we want to like chat about the stuff in that, to share we could always use that hacks camp slack channel that uh, is true yep so uh keep it real in the elms and slack so we'll uh we'll see you next week